So we want to welcome you to church today on this Valentine's week. Um, I just have to believe your week is going to go better because you've been here and uh, you're experiencing this. And as Kerry mentioned last week, we started live streaming last week. We had a few issues, kind of uh, got some major upgrades to that whole thing. So um, like last week, there was somebody who uh, commented during the service, this is awesome because now I can watch church from work. So I guess that's cool um, until their boss finds out. But uh, anyways, so, um, you know, there'll be people joining us eventually from all over the world. So um, uh, we're believing that uh, we can carry the message just a little bit further than, than this room. So, um, but if you're here for your first time, we welcome you. We say around here, we don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've done, who you've done it with. We're excited that you're here. We appreciate you being here. We hope you'll encounter some love. You'll not feel judged. Uh, you'll feel like you've found a home, and hopefully you'll come back again next week. I, too, want to uh, thank Jim for building this stage. Um, I was sitting there thinking... Well, number one, I'll put a plug in for him. If any of you ever need any remodeling work done in your house or whatever, Jim is your guy, all right? Don't mess around with any other contractor. He might not be able to do it tomorrow. He might take, might take him a few months to get to you, but I promise you it's worth it in the long run because you won't be hassling with a, well, some of you have had that experience, right, Janet? So um, some of you have and are having experiences. Um, I think about Adam's aunt needed some work done. I said, what about Jim? Uh, she said, I just can't wait that long. It's been a year and a half and she's still trying to get it complete. So uh, Jim's an amazing uh, builder and um, so he's your guy and he'll price you out fair, right? Right, Jim? Okay. Now, having said that, I know you've built a lot of things in your life, you know, in the 15, 20 years, you know, since you started doing this. Um, I was sitting over there thinking, uh, I don't know if you've ever built anything as important as what you built this last week, because what this stage represents is, is to me, I, I thought about in the building of the temple in the Bible and how important that altar was and everything that went into that, and all the meaning that is tangled up and tied up in that. And I thought about this place here and, and, and this thing here. It represents an altar, and it represents a, a team of people who lead this congregation into the presence of God. And, it, and it's a platform for teaching and so many other things, and so it's just more than two by eights and, and plywood. Uh, this is something special, and so thank you so much for doing that as he took three and a half days off of work. All for, all for two unhealthy lunches and all the peanut M&Ms you can eat, right? So, uh, and, and if you brought your bag, I can refill you on that. And then Carl is a beast, right? Carl's, Carl's thrilled that he went home on Thursday with all 10 fingers and 10 toes. And, and with that, that was called a success, right? Nobody lost any limbs or, or fingers or anything this week. But um, the building of this is, is, is a lot of work. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something else, is that the dismantling of the old stuff that was in here, right, Carl? Uh, oh, my goodness. I, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, that green carpet, we just left a few things with green carpet on it so you, you know, um, don't miss it too bad yet. Uh, but try to pull that off. Whatever carpet layers do to glue carpet down, it works. Um, yeah, it works. So um, anyways, thanks you guys for all, all the work that you've done. Um, Even a guy that came to give us an estimate on the, on the covering of this said, who in the world built this? He did an amazing job. And I said, well, thank you. Um, no, I, I didn't. I, I, gave you the, I gave you all the credit. Uh, as I told Jim, you know, he, he pictured all this in his mind, figured out the materials almost down to the last piece of wood. And I'm just like, I, I can't do that, you know. 
now that I see it, it's like, oh, okay, that's what you're talking about, right? So that's kind of how it goes. But anyways, um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to whatever might happen here with this and, and the sound. And if you don't like the sound today, $10,000 will fix that. <laughs> now you laugh at that. We said $2,000 for this, and then somebody gave Carrie $2,100 bills. Um, so... I can't do the math of how many hundred dollar bills that is for 10,000, but um, you can figure that out. Yeah. John says a hundred with that, we'll go with that. So a hundred 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 dollar bills, and um, you know, there'll be a, a new sound system in here that um, you know, will actually be what the room needed to begin with, but anyways, you know, so uh, uh, enough of that. But as I said, um, this is Valentine's week. You know, it's like uh, when I was a kid and you had a birthday, you celebrated a birthday, right? My birthday is October 26th, so that's the day that we celebrated my birthday. When Carrie came along, her birthday is July 1st, but it was no longer a birthday, it was a birth month. And it kind of became like a birth season. So it's no longer just a day. And then Valentine's Day used to be a day. But now it's like a week or a season. But just to kind of get you in the mood, did you hear about the two bed bugs who fell in love? They're getting married in the spring. Did you hear about the lady who fell in love with the pastry chef? Yeah, he deserted her. Um, <laughs> Do you know how the, uh, how the phone proposed to his girlfriend on Valentine's Day? He gave her a ring. Do you know what one snake said to the other snake on Valentine's Day? Give me a little hug and a hiss, honey. Um, do you know what the paper clip said to the magnet on Valentine's Day? I find you very attractive. Two antenna met on a roof, fell in love and got married. Their wedding ceremony wasn't fancy. The reception, however, was excellent. <laughs> and last but not least, do you know the difference between a $20 steak and a $55 steak? February 14th, that's, that's the deal. So happy Valentine's Day to all of you. And uh, if you're single, happy Independence Week and save a lot of money week. That's, that's what it is for you, yeah. Uh, as I said, uh, with this Thursday being Valentine's Day, it's a day when we celebrate love. And whether you have someone special to love or someone special who is loving you, I want you to know that there is one who loves you more than you could ever imagine, and that one is God. We often hear the expression, God loves you, and sometimes it comes across as just a cheap phrase, but I want you to know that it is absolutely true. When I think about my own life, despite the dents and dings, despite my failures, my shortcomings, and my screw-ups, God loves me. I'd be wholly lost if it weren't for the abundant love of my Heavenly Father, and He loved me enough to forgive me and to transform my life. And when I consider God's forgiveness, I think about the depth of my sin and I stand in awe because I know who I really am. I know my thoughts and my deeds. I not only know the sins that other people know, but I know the sins I've committed that no one else knows. And to think that God loves me and that he still loves me is indescribable. I don't deserve to be loved like that, and I certainly don't deserve to be forgiven. But God called me out of darkness and brought me into his marvelous light. When I was incapable of pursuing righteousness, God saved me and he gave me a new identity as someone who is righteous and pure in his eyes. Before the forgiveness offered me through Christ, I had no access to a true relationship with my Heavenly Father. I had no access to the fruit of the Spirit. I had no way to know and experience the depth of God's love. As my life was rooted in destruction with no way out, 
Yet God saw fit to forgive every transgression I have ever committed and will commit, no matter how big or small. He could have said, I'll only forgive your minor sins, or he could have said, I'll only forgive sins up to 1,000 and then stop. But no, the Father so longed to restore me that he paid the highest price by giving his son Jesus, and he forgave all my sins, no exceptions. In Psalm 103, the Bible says he does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve for his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. And that vast chasm that separated me from God is gone. And now he says, I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. What love and what forgiveness. Sometimes I don't feel forgiven, but the facts in God's word are greater than the feelings in my life. I may not always feel forgiven, but I celebrate the fact that I am forgiven and that my life is no longer found in the identity of my dents and dings, but in the death of Jesus Christ on a cross. And many of you in this room have experienced something very similar. What a beautiful thing. As we continue this Simple Life series today, I wanna to talk about how we can go from wounded to whole. And I realize that on any given Sunday, a good portion of the congregation are sitting there wounded. We've all been wronged and wounded, all of us. That's one thing I would say we all have in common. Over the years as a pastor, I've, I've been privileged to journey with people and hear so many stories of people as they've suffered offense or mistreatment or victimization or betrayal. I've seen a lot of wounds and I've heard the hearts of wounded people. And what I've learned is that we grossly misunderestimate the true cost of living without dealing with those relational wounds that come our way or even the ones we are guilty of dishing out. We might think that we can go on through life unaffected by conflicts and fractures with people that we care about, but that's far from true. Relational breakdowns suck energy from us. They take up head space, they take up heart space, and they hang over us like a dark gray cloud. But simple life requires attending to those broken relationships. Now, I don't think anyone understands broken relationships better than Jesus. In fact, check this out. Right in the midst of being wronged, right in the midst of dying on a cross, Jesus forgave his cold-hearted executioners who were killing him. In Luke 22, verse 34, the Bible says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Wow. That right there has to be one of the most extraordinary prayers ever uttered. Those 11 words have rocked the lives of hearts and readers for centuries. You see, you and I live in a world of wrongdoers, filled with wrongdoers doing wrong. They're everywhere. I'm one of them. So are you. I'm actually a serial wrongdoer, <laughs> and so are you. What we learn fairly quickly in life is that no one is perfect, and therefore we cannot live expecting perfection out of everyone. There are no perfect parents, there are no perfect friends, there are no perfect work colleagues, there are no perfect siblings or spouses. Unfair things happen to all of us. Unfair things happen to all of us. People are gonna let us down. People are gonna say things that hurt. People are, might even do things much worse than that to us. No one is perfect. So what do we do when we're wronged? What do we do when we're hurt and wounded? 
I want to suggest today that we look at the hurts and the wrongs done to us in one of three categories, or chairs for that matter. I thought, you know, if hurricanes can have categories, then our hurts and wounds can too. So like category number one, we're going to consider these as minor offenses. As I talk about these three, you might picture yourself sitting in one of these chairs because this is where you're at in life as we are gathered here this morning. But these minor offenses are what we might call just little speed bumps. But if that's you sitting in that chair as the offended party, you've probably lost track of the reality and the ability to see things from the other person's perspective. And maybe you've stepped into that poor me mode. It's not really a big deal, but to you, the affronted person, it seems to be. And thus, the reason that you play the victim card. This could be a whole host of things, but imagine that at your work, a colleague comes to you, or you are gathered in a meeting with a group of colleagues, and one of those colleagues laughs when you present your idea. Now you are offended. You are offended because someone laughed at your idea. And to that, I just want to say, really? I mean, you feel wronged by that for real? That minor offense? Hopefully, just in saying that, it might cause you to step back from that perceived uh, offense and see it a little more objectively. What I've noticed about people is people often overreact. You ever met someone like that? Probably none of you, but people on the outside of these four walls, many of them overreact. And with all that's going on in the world, a person gets offended because someone happened to laugh at their idea. You say, really? Maybe we ought to be more like frogs. Do you know that, do you know why frogs are always so happy? Because they eat whatever bugs them. Yeah, and maybe we should be a little bit more like that. Maybe you should try that. Just eat whatever it is that is bugging you and move on. Now, Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, it's that chapter of love that we often hear read at weddings and such, but in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 13, when Paul is exhorting Christ's followers like you and me, he exhorts us to be people who are not easily angered. Not easily angered. Some translations say not irritable, or I like this, not overly sensitive. Now, if our teeth are oversensitive, we try to do something about it. But if we are oversensitive, oftentimes we just try to plow on through life. But you can be oversensitive to little minor speed bumps that come your way. In those moments when things don't go your way or something is said that you wish hadn't been said, let's not play the victim card. But let's keep things in perspective and have enough grace to easily, easily overlook these category one speed bumps. That we could more easily forgive the minor offenses and to quickly forget about them, should I add, should I add and then simply get on with life. Keeping your relational slate clean is absolutely required for simple life. Now, the next time you get offended at a category one minor offense, which you probably will and maybe before the day, before you get all bent out of shape and harbor this and let it just fester inside, just consider a few things. Remind yourself that you are a child of God. 
that you've been redeemed. You have the Holy Spirit in your life. You have been blessed beyond measure. You have a wonderful church. You've got an incredible family. You have good health. You have a hope and a future, and heaven is awaiting you. So why get tripped up and get mad at a little speed bump? Some things are not worth your energy. Maybe you read this book several years back, but don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. If this is you, maybe you could pray a modified version of Jesus' 11-word prayer that he prayed from the cross. Father, forgive me, for I, I don't know what I'm doing. And just simplify your life and let go of category one minor offenses. Because you see, I think if you listen closely to those offenses, you'll hear them singing that 1989 Engelbert Humperdinck song, please release me, let me go. (laughs) Release those things and just let them go. Another category of hurts and wounds are what we'll call legitimate wounds. Now, these legitimate wounds are wounds that require resolution and healing. Now, I'm not a prophet or anything, but I will say that sooner or later, you will experience a category two hurt or wound if you haven't already. Maybe that wound was created because you had a parent who constantly criticized you while you were growing up. Or you have a colleague that sabotaged your project. Or maybe you experienced racism. Or maybe a friend cheated you out of something. Or maybe someone didn't keep their promise of confidentiality. Or maybe your partner had an affair. All of these have big consequences. These are all category two legitimate wounds. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I, I'm dealing with that right now. I am suffering from a category two legitimate wound. I just want to say to you, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I, I'm not trying to minimize your pain at all because I don't think that should have ever happened to you. I know you're probably feeling certain things because we all do at times. You want the other person who's the source of your hurt to hurt as much as you do. I get that. You probably feel like there should be some sort of justice, right? You're probably thinking, what about this eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth kind of a thing? Don't wrongdoers deserve to be punished? But you see, the problem with that sort of thinking is that it doesn't give the depth of satisfaction to you as you think it might. And focusing on revenge-seeking doesn't lead to simple life because at the end of the day, despite our hurts, we must forgive. It's the only door to healing. Now, I get it. Forgiveness is easier said than done. I know you're sitting there looking at me and you're thinking, sure, you can say that from up there. You've got this beautiful stage to speak from and you can say that pretty easily. But you don't know the pain and the hurt and the wounds that I'm dealing with because of, and fill in the blank. I know it's not easy. But like Lily Tomlin once said, to forgive is to give up all hope for a better past. At some point, you're going to have to deal with the issue. At a minimum, I think it means doing what Jesus did when he was mistreated. It means we fully acknowledge the wrong that was done to us, we grieve over what has been lost, and eventually we let the other person off the hook. Really not for their sake, but for our sake. Whenever you're ready to attempt forgiveness, the Bible gives us what we're going to call five go instructions. Five go instructions. 
So I want to walk through these with you. Number one is simply the word go. In Matthew 18, verse 15, Jesus outlines what to do in situations when you've been wronged. And he simply says, if one of my followers sins against you, go and point out what was wrong. If there's a relational fracture, no matter who it is that caused it, you go. That's the very first step towards reconciliation. You have to go. Number two, you go alone. Furthermore, in that verse, Jesus said, if one of my followers sins against you, go and point out what was wrong, but do it in private just between the two of you. You don't pick up the phone and call your friends and go, hey, you know what Joe did? Man, it was terrible. He breached confidentiality with me and he went out and he told everybody and he said, and then fill in the blank. But here's what I've discovered, that too often people who are betrayed through a breach of confidence or through gossip, oftentimes will go out and tell others about how they were betrayed, committing the very same offense that was committed against them and most of the time never see the irony in that. Go alone, the Bible says. Don't tell anybody else all the details about your conflict. Go to the offender directly and talk it over. Number three, go to reconcile the relationship. When Jesus tells us to go in private to someone who's offended us, his, his goal is really that that relationship would be reconciled. Because look what the passage also says. If that person listens, you have won back a follower. This means we, we can't go to someone on the defensive for us, can't go to someone with the sole purpose of trying to pay them back and to hurt them back, but how about instead we go to that person and we say to them something like this, hey, Joe, we've been friends for a long time. And I'd like to be friends for a long time to come, but something has come up that I need to talk to you about. And I feel wounded by it, but I know it's likely that you haven't fully taken into account, uh, that I haven't fully taken into account your perspective. So I'm coming to you believing that if we can talk about this, we can understand one another better, we can forgive each other, and I believe our friendship will be even closer and more trusted will be on the back side of this. So can we talk about it now, Joe? My guess is that if we go and we go alone and we go to reconcile the relationship, about 90% of our relational breakdowns can be healed just by simply following this one verse. Now you might be thinking, so what if I go to someone and I try to do this, but the other person doesn't respond well? Well, Jesus also offers us some counsel on that too. As if you can't get the, uh, the, the problem worked out, the issue worked out during the first meeting, he says there in that Matthew 18 passage that you might need to take a trusted friend, I would suggest a mutual friend of both of you, and try it again. Now ultimately, you might have to involve an elder or something like that, but most of the time, if you go right away in private and with a spirit of reconciliation, you'll be able to work things out. Number four, go now. So how long should you wait before trying to reconcile things? When do you go? Well, Jesus answers this question back in Matthew chapter five. So say you're in a church service, the music is ripping, the place is packed, and right in the middle of the service, right in the middle of the singing and such, the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder and reminds you that you and Joe are not okay. According to the Bible, you've gotta get up and you've gotta leave the service, even if it means you have to crawl over 10 people to get out of your row to do it. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 5. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. So not tomorrow, not next week, right now. And once you've got that done, then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. Healing your broken relationship, in Jesus' opinion, is more important than you singing the songs during the service. 
Number five, let it go. I don't think I stayed awake for the entire movie Frozen, but I think this is a song that some character sings in there. And maybe it ought to be a song that we just keep playing in our minds as well. Sometimes you can do everything right. You go, you go alone, you go to reconcile the relationship, and you go now, but then the other person on that other end won't reconcile. Instead, they flip you off. They say, you know, forget you. I'm holding on to my anger, my grudge, and I can care less whether you came here or what. Once you've done your part, you're clean before God, and you're released from that. Just go on your way. The Apostle Paul tucks a beautiful verse into Romans 12 that addresses this issue. He says in chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, suggesting it isn't, it is not always possible, but if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, you doing your part, live at peace with everyone. You can't control everybody's responses. They might refuse to reconcile with you for the rest of their lives, but if you've done your part, even if that other person won't reconcile, you're clean before God and you're released and you need to let it go. Now, if the relationship is restored by following these five uh, uh, go uh, things, then thank God and let it go. And if the relationship cannot be restored despite your best efforts, go on with your life and let it go. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's something we need to strive to do. There's a third category that's a lot more serious. This is what we'll call life-shattering injustices. A life-shattering injustice oftentimes comes out of nowhere. It's an unthinkable tragedy that forever changes the landscape of your life. Now, by God's grace, not everyone in this room will experience a Category 3 life-shattering injustice in their lifetime. But how do you deal with a rape? How do you deal with being sexually molested all your growing up years by your father? How do you deal with the fact that your husband's best friend accidentally shot and killed him? How do you deal with the fact that your police officer husband and father or father was murdered and the killer is now incarcerated? These are examples of category three life-shattering injustices. All of those that I mentioned, I've dealt with with people throughout the course of, of ministry. It's not easy. Anger, bitterness, desire for vengeance, those are all common default responses. And though these hurts seem unforgivable, you must forgive the unforgivable. Forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does enlarge the future. And because of the seriousness of, of these kinds of injustices, forgiveness might take much longer. It might take a lifetime. But the failure to forgive gives power to the one who has wronged you. It is you, not they, who are hurt by your unwillingness to forgive. But no, that just because you forgive doesn't mean that the perpetrator should not pay a debt to society. That might be a part of their redemptive process. That doesn't mean you wouldn't go to a courtroom and testify against that person. This is what we might call radical forgiveness. Most of us in this room have never had to do this one. But radical forgiveness is a powerful thing. 
When you observe someone exercising radical forgiveness, it causes your jaw to drop. And you start thinking to yourself, how could they do that? Because the normal human heart seeks revenge. And you're thinking, how could you find it in your heart to forgive that person? A couple of years ago, I learned that a friend of mine um, finally opened up and shared about his father. That when he was a young teenager, I think, his father was a police officer and was murdered. And the killer was now incarcerated, of course. That's all I knew of that story for, for a couple of years until uh, sometime late last year, I got a text from him because he lives out of state now, and he uh, texted me and said, Bill, could you, would you pray for my mother and I? Because I'm going back to Ohio, and my mother and I are going to go to the prison where my dad's killer is, and we're going to visit him all in an effort to extend forgiveness to him. I'm just like, whoa. I thought, dude, you're a better person than I am because I, I don't know if I could do that. I, I don't know how a person does that. And I followed up with him afterwards and he said, yeah, we, we were able to visit and it went well and... Um, we see this as a process that will take a good amount of time to, to work through. It takes a different kind of a heart to offer forgiveness than to seek revenge. But I think that's the heart that Jesus modeled for us when he forgave his murderers while in the very act of killing him. So what changes a normal human heart into a new, different kind of heart that can express that radical forgiveness even in the face of a Category 3 injustice? I think it starts when we experience the forgiveness of our own sins through the cross of Christ and that transforming grace of God that has been exercised to us. I think when we begin to have an accurate understanding of our own shortcomings before a holy God, it empowers us to choose radical forgiveness too. The truth of the matter is it's much easier to extend forgiveness to others when we're fully aware of how much God has forgiven us. Jesus said of a prostitute who had anointed his feet with expensive perfume in Luke 7, 47, he said, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. You see, I think when we fully comprehend the radical forgiveness of God, the radical forgiveness that God extends to us, while we were yet sinners, that alone has the power to change our hearts. And when your heart is filled every day by the kindness of the Father, you have enough of his grace overflowing that you can now extend his grace to others. When your heart is seared with the practical truths from God's word about what to do when, wrong, when wronged, you'll have some insight as to how to navigate through category two and category three situations. You'll begin to understand the uh, alternative to hostility and bitterness and revenge seeking. If your heart has been taught that revenge seeking slowly destroys the soul of the people who attempt it, then the only viable option 
even if you've been horribly and tragically wronged, is to return to that 11-word prayer prayed by someone who was wronged in the worst conceivable way, in a way that cost him his life. But Jesus found a way to free himself from the bitterness through those profoundly simple words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. If you have been tragically wounded, I believe you can be set free from the anger and the bitterness and vengeance seeking. I believe you can be liberated from maybe decades of hostility and wishing the worst for that other person. It's not easy, for sure. What do you do when the man who raped you in your own home through a break-in is about to get released? What do you do when you still have to see your father who sexually molested you your entire life growing up and now he wants to see his granddaughter? What do you do when you look at your husband's best friend who both Uh, law enforcement officers sitting in a living room looking at one of their pistols. It accidentally fired and hit the guy in the head and killed him instantly. What do you do? How do you look at that best friend who killed his best friend accidentally? And how do you sit looking through a glass talking on the phone to someone who has murdered your father or your husband? It's a lifelong process at best. And every now and then you have to circle back and get your heart right again. And every now and then you have to circle back and pray Jesus' loving word prayer again. Maybe you have to pray that every day just to stay clean and to remain free of bitterness. Now listen, those tragedies... Those heroes, I would call them, have experienced don't go away simply because they've forgiven the person that has wronged them. But those offenses don't continue to multiply and breed either. Most people think forgiveness benefits only the other person, that person who hurt you, when actually the main beneficiary of forgiveness is you. Man, I have the most, utmost respect for people like my friend who would be willing to go and look eye to eye of the man who killed his father and caused him to live most of his very important growing up years without a dad. I have all the respect in the world for people that can do that kind of a thing. People who want to follow Jesus' example and and try to move from being wounded to being whole. But this is part of what it means to be a Christ follower. We use that expression too. Yeah, I follow Jesus. Yeah, I follow Jesus. That's easy to do when everything's perfect in your life. Hey, anybody can follow Jesus then. But when you've experienced a life-shattering injustice, you're looking at the man who killed your dad? Are you gonna be a Christ follower? I'm talking about following the one who looked at those who were in the act of killing him and said, Father, forgive them, they have no idea what they're doing. Sometimes following Jesus is difficult. But if you allow an offense to take up residency in your heart for very long, that offense will produce resentment, it'll produce bitterness, it'll produce unforgiveness. And if you keep holding on to that hurt and that bitterness and the poison of that hurt, it will become a part of who you are and it will begin to define you. 
So don't allow unforgiveness to hold you captive and define you. Don't let it rob you of your energy that would be better invested in other pursuits. The sooner you can begin this process of forgiveness and the sooner you can release those who have hurt you, the sooner you can live in a new kind of liberation of freedom. When you move from wounded to whole, you move to more simple life. So, have you been offended by a category one minor offense? Do you feel violated by the little things? Has anyone ever told you or have many people told you you're way too sensitive that you blow things out of proportion? You're too easily offended? So remember, these things are just little speed bumps. Just let them go. Do not let them put down roots. Just let it go. Okay, so somebody didn't like your, your idea. So what? You don't even know what's behind what they said and why they said it or that look. Sometimes we get offended just because someone looked at us the wrong way. When in fact, they might have actually been looking at someone else, not even looking at you. Haven't you ever had that when someone was looking your direction and you're thinking, are they looking at me? Is there somebody behind me? You're not talking to me? <laughs> they might not have ever intended what they said that would be taken that way. They have no idea that that would ever be to have been taken that way. And you're all bent out of shape about it. Just let it go. Do you have an unresolved category two legitimate wound? Perhaps somebody disappointed you. Perhaps somebody betrayed a confidence. Perhaps somebody broke a promise. Hey, I give it to you. Maybe you have a legitimate reason for being wounded. But have you been holding on to that for too long? It's also got to go. You follow the go. Go alone. Go to restore the relationship. Go now. Let it go. Follow through that process. If you started that process and it stalled out, where did it stall out? Because you can get back into the game and you can resume the process again. You could go back now, it's not too late. You can go back now and, and pick that up and, and, and see it through to the end in hopes of forgiving and reconciling a relationship. If sadly you've experienced a category three life-shattering injustice, you have my deepest sympathies and all my respect. I admire your courage for continuing on. But I just need to encourage you to continue to move toward forgiveness. I know right now you might think there is absolutely no way I'll ever be able to forgive the person who did that horrible thing to me. But let me just encourage you with the fact that the Holy Spirit can give you the power to forgive in time if you offer him your desire to do so. Forgiveness is a lifelong process, and it may be difficult, but choose the difficult but better way of dealing with wrongdoing. Choose forgiveness. If you're willing to at least say yes to someday forgiving that person or those people who have wronged you in a category three way, Just begin the path of praying, Father, forgive them, and help me to forgive them too. I release my right to exact revenge. I release my desire for control. Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's a prayer that can help lead you to this simple life but you've got to be willing to open that door and step out of that door to freedom and forgive those people who have hurt you so that the scars in your life can become symbols of God's redeeming love rather than a reminder of painful events.
let those scars become symbols. That when someone looks at you and thinks, how could they ever forgive that person? That you just say, that's a symbol of God's redeeming love in my life. And I choose to focus on that rather than those painful events. Honestly, without God, I'm, I'm not sure how any of us could ever do any of these, forgive any of these. That's probably why we have a world of people who are so angry and bitter and just seeking revenge because they don't know how. They don't see a way to forgive. But if you were a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within you and he can give you the power to forgive. And he will. It may not be an instant thing. It may be a process. It might be a period of time, but he will give you the power to forgive. And be released from all of that that you harbor, maybe have harbored for such a long time. You can be free. First, I would say you, you need to experience God's love and forgiveness like I described at the start of this talk that I've experienced. All that I said about me is probably true of you too. You know who you really are. You know all the things you've said and done, all the thoughts that you have had. You know a lot more things than anybody else in this world knows about you and you might be thinking there's no way anybody could love me knowing that, but I want you to know God can. And he does. You simply need to open your life up and embrace that love and, and let him forgive you. Let him wipe the slate clean. His forgiveness is so powerful that not only are your sins forgiven, but you are restored in a relationship to him. And he loves you and deals with you and approaches you uh, on an everyday basis as if you had never done those things. It's unbelievable. It is absolutely unbelievable. It, it, it's, it's inconceivable that someone could do that, but that's what makes God, God. And you need to experience that first. That's the first step for you. If you've not done that, that's the very first step for you, that you would embrace God's love and receive his forgiveness and walk out of here knowing that everything you've ever done, thought, said, has been removed as far as the east is from the west. And God will never hold that against you again, not only the things that you have done, but even the things that you will do. Be forgiven, to walk out of here forgiven, to know I've been forgiven. Uh, you know, the charges are, are dropped, I'm, I'm free, I'm free of that. You can walk out of here free of that today. You just simply need to express that to God. God, that's what I want. I, I want to be free. I want to be forgiven. I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to begin following you. That's step number one. And then once you realize how screwed up and how messed up you have been and yet God still loved you, you then can begin to look at other people who are screwed up and messed up and forgive them too. You can't expect perfection out of everybody except you. No one's perfect. And people are going to unintentionally and probably intentionally wound you. Many of your wounds that you carry to this day may be unintentional wounds. And you harbor all this and you've harbored all this for such a long time and the other person has no idea that they've ever wounded you. And if they did, they would probably fall on their knees weeping, begging you to forgive them because they did it unintentionally. God needs to forgive you and you need to forgive yourself and you need to forgive others. 
And as strange as this sounds, you might even need to forgive God. Just remember, this is not heaven. And tragic things sometimes happen. Sometimes innocent teenagers are killed by a drunk driver. Sometimes a decorated police officer is murdered. Sometimes people are in a building that a plane flies into and it collapses. Sometimes people are innocently driving down the highway when a shot is fired from somewhere and kills them. I don't get it. My only explanation to that is this is not heaven. This is a screwed up, messed up world, but there is something better that's coming. And I have to know that the God who loves me and who has forgiven me and who lives within me will journey with me and walk with me through whatever things I go through in my life. And he'll bring me through to the other side. And one day in heaven, I'll have a much more clear understanding and so will you. Let's pray. First, Lord, I want to say how thankful and grateful I am that you love me. How thankful and grateful I am that you have forgiven me. I'm thankful and grateful for how much love you have for every person that's hearing this today, Lord. And your desire is to forgive them too. No matter what we've done, your forgiveness can cover. And I pray that every one of us in this room, before we walk out these doors, every one of us, wherever we may be right now, will open ourselves up to you, God, and say, forgive me. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. And I am free. And then with that, Lord, the things that we deal with in life, these different offenses, these different wounds, these different injustices that we experience, Lord, we ask, I ask that today you would help us to choose forgiveness, as difficult as it is to choose forgiveness, to choose to forgive the unforgivable even, to choose to release people, to let things go, to, to not allow that unforgiveness to produce anger and bitterness and vengeance and just really destroy our lives from the inside out, Lord. Let us be free of that today. And uh, the minor offenses that we've experienced, Lord, just let us, help us just to let those things go, to be done with them as we walk out these doors and breathe fresh air, Lord, that those things would just be done with, over. We'll let them go. We'll not look at those other people tomorrow at work any differently. We'll just love them too. And these legitimate wounds that we've experienced, Lord, some of them are very, very terrible. We're certainly not condoning those kinds of actions, Lord, but help us to be forgivers, to choose forgiveness, to go to that person, to talk to that person, to try to reconcile and just know that we've done our level best at doing that and that we're going to be free at the end of that process. And those in this room, Lord, that have experienced these life-shattering injustices, I can't say that I have, but I know there are probably people in this room who have. And I would ask that you would help them to walk through that door to freedom by forgiving, at least by beginning that process of forgiveness. Lord, we need that. We want to be free, Lord, and that's what you intend for us. And we claim these things through the power of Almighty God, that we are free. In Jesus' name, amen.